You're listening to The Corbett Report. All right. Well, uh, James, I brought you on the program today to speak about anarchy. Um, this is something I've become very fascinated with uh, over the past couple of years, and I was hoping to discuss with you about how we can actually move towards this type of social uh, organization. So, James, there are many misconceptions about anarchy, and for the sake of clarification, could you uh, define anarchy as you understand it? <laughs> now, you see, this is really the heart of the entire issue, so <laughs> we could probably spend the entire time on this question alone. And I don't want to be evasive about it, and I'm not trying to be coy or, or to, uh, to make this into a, a, a more grandiose answer than it needs to be. But I honestly believe that, uh, that if there is anything at all that is indicative of anarchism, it is that anarchism is not a singular ideology with a singular definition or a singular purpose that looks one particular way or another. It it's not that type of uh, of ideology at all. I would say it's an ecosystem of ideologies, some of which are non-exclusionary, are compatible, some of which are completely opposed and at odds. So that you can have collectivist anarchism and individualist anarchism, you can have revolutionary anarchism, you can have pacifist anarchism, you can have atheist anarchism, you can have Christian anarchism, you can have communist anarchism, socialist anarchism, high-tech anarchism, primitivist anarchism, uh, industrial anarchism, environmentalist anarchism. Anarchism, property uh, abolitionist anarchism, free market anarchism, mutualist anarchism. I, I could go on, um, but I, I hope that at least paints part of the picture that, that I'm trying to paint here. Again, there are so many different aspects to this. Uh, perhaps the best way to approach the question of what is anarchy, um, maybe what are anarchies might be a better way of framing that, is to is to look at the, the word itself, of course. Anarchism comes from the root word anarchy, which of course comes from the Greek word anarchos, which just means one without ruler. And this, of course, lends itself to all sorts of uh, debate in and of itself. W what does that mean, um, one without ruler? Does that mean simply that this is against government, per se? Or is this against all forms of hierarchical organization? And again, you get different answers from different branches of anarchical thought. And so I, I find it interesting. Anarchism certainly is a topic that is becoming more commonly uh, debated and talked about online. But in these bastions of philosophical debate, like the comment section of YouTube.com, um, <laughs> people tend to be very, very certain about the very simple definition of anarchism. And I always tend to laugh at that because it generally denotes to me someone who's never actually picked up a, a book and, and read any of these things, which is why I started the, the Well-Read Anarchist uh, podcast which at this point is a very halting and uh, hasn't progressed very far. But hopefully in the coming weeks, months and years, we will be going over uh, a number of different works of, of some of the, the foundational anarchist thinkers. And we're starting right now with the person who was the first self-identified anarchist at any rate. I, I wouldn't say that he was the first anarchist per se, but the first person who identified himself as an anarchist, uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who wrote, uh, well, his famous work is What is Property? Taking a look at... Uh, again, the concept of property and and how that applies or doesn't apply, and and that was really the basis for for a lot of anarchical thought in the early to mid eighteenth, uh, sorry, nineteenth century when this was uh, was first being formalized. But uh, again, this touches on not only economic organization, not only uh, political organization, not only social organization. But I think it also touches on issues of praxeology. What, what can we take at base? And that's, that's the direction from which I approach it. So, in fact, I, I am one of those people who does not actually even use the term anarchist in my self-definition um, because I, I, I just think it has become so, so broad, so diverse that as a label, it is almost useless. And I can sympathize with the people in your audience who might be sick of all of these special little snowflakes claiming they can't possibly put a, a label to their ideology because they're so complex. So if if there was a, uh, a gun put to my head and I had to, to, in one way or another, define myself, I suppose I would identify with the term voluntarist, um, which comes from the, the, the idea of voluntarism, which again, brings with it its own baggage that I don't necessarily intend. It's usually associated with the so-called anarcho-capitalist philosophy, which there are many anarchists who would say is not anarchism, but at any rate, um, it generally bases itself not on the economic arguments or the, the political arguments, but on the, the ethical principle that all forms of human association should be voluntary in nature. And that's what I identify with. Fundamentally, I think that 
that that uh, ethical construct allows for all various forms of social and economic and political compacts, so long as they follow that rule that those the, the people associating in those compacts are doing so voluntarily. I, I for one, don't have a problem with anyone uh, choosing to organize themselves in a different way than I would. And uh, I think that's what it comes down to to me. It's not an, uh, an economic or a social or a political structure. It is an ethical principle. And that's what I identify with. So I, I'm sorry to take the very, very long route towards answering your question. But unfortunately, there's no way around it. This is just one of those things that I think anyone approaching anarchism has to deal with. That's actually how I understood it, too, was uh, that it's kind of more of an ethical framework more than anything else. And um uh, in uh, what you were just talking about in your uh, well-read anarchist podcast, reading some of the works of uh, Pierre Joseph Perdon, he said that uh, if you wanted political equality, abolish property. Uh, now, what what does this mean to you? Well, it, Proudhon approached this from the perspective of looking at the idea of property ownership and what it is at base is, of course, the idea that a property owner can do what he wants with his property, including using it, abusing it, using it up and even destroying it. And this was something that he had a, a problem with when we're talking about such things as people who own, for example, a patch of land or a, a patch of land that has on it a, a body of water or what have you. This obviously starts to become problematic because, of course, it means that ultimately humans have the right through property to basically destroy the earth itself and uh, to deprive future generations of the use of that. So this was what he was looking at in, in that work and um, in a very interesting manner, I think. Um, uh, there's, of course, a lot of knee-jerk reactions that will be put up depending on what perspectives people are coming from in this, but I think that does a disservice to the argument that he's putting together that there's a difference between property, property ownership, as as we just defined it, and rightful possession, uh, uh, i.e. you can have possessions that are yours and that you um, have uh, the rightful use of, but that does not necessarily mean that you have that right not only into perpetuity, but also to give to your descendants and that they also have that right and that they can basically monopolize, uh, for example, a patch of the earth and, and do with it as they will. Um, and, and that, uh, I, again, it's a, it's a, a complicated uh, philosophy and one that branches out in a lot of different directions and one that I don't think Pierre-Joseph Proudhon necessarily came to his own definitive understanding of throughout his life. There were a lot of contradictions in his own thought. For example, he was the one who came up with the idea or at least advocated the idea of spontaneous order being the organizing principle of society, i.e. through voluntary interactions, people will come to an order that they could not otherwise come to, to in a system of authoritarian governmental system uh, structures. And this is the basis of modern day mutualist economic theory. Um, however, Proudhon himself was actually a, a politician in his own day and age, and he did actually side uh, in, in numerous political issues with socialists rather than with anarchists. So he had his own contradictions in terms of what he was arguing, and I think you can see that when you start to take a look at the broader scope of his work. Mm -hmm. And looking at, the, at, at how um, basically anarchy would play itself out, uh, one might uh, one might ask the question, uh, but who would build the roads? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, the the age old question. And the funny thing I think about the question itself is that the uh, the the question, of course, is used by those who are coming f at this from a, a statist mindset, i.e., people who advocate the idea that we do need some sort of government in order to organize society because there are certain types of activities like building roads that simply could not be done in any other way. And I think the irony of this particular example is that the only thing that the government does in our modern day society is take the collective uh, will that that almost everyone shares that we do need roads for uh, for uh, to to conduct our transactions and take that as a, uh, as the excuse to use the money which the government itself extracts from the populace to then give to companies that then build the roads so <laughs> in fact the real answer even in our own society is that corporations and companies tend to actually build the roads. But in this society, the way it's structured currently, we have this middleman called government that uh, is seen to be this benevolent force that is doing it. But of course, that is not really the case. Um, so, so there are a number of different ways to answer this. And I think that perhaps we could get more to the 
the kind of underlying part of this question, because, of course, the underlying uh, part is that is to say that there are certain things that simply cannot be done without some sort of hierarchical structure of people who um, make a decision or come to a decision in some manner and then enact it. And if we can't do that, then how can we organize society? And again, I think that this shows a reticence on the behalf of many people, and I think an understandable reticence to believe in the idea of spontaneous order, of the idea that voluntary, peaceful interactions can bring about the things that we want collectively, just as assuredly as a a, a body claiming to have authority over everyone that can ultimately resort to violence um, has has the ability to to enact that order. And I say it's understandable that people are reticent to believe that because. Uh, we uh, in our society, the way that we are today, I I I agree. If all of the the controls, all of the, the the hierarchical institutions, if government itself was just suddenly eradicated from the face of the earth overnight, I don't think we would be equipped as a society, as a civilization, to really handle that because we are steeped, obviously, in certain political and economic and social constructs that we have been in all of our lives to to basically uh, to accept this authority from on high. And we are not equipped with the, the resources that I think we would need in order to understand how to interact with each other in order to accomplish things um, without that parental governmental figure in uh, mediating between us. And I don't think that's an insoluble problem. I do think that we can learn how to negotiate and, and, and interact with others in peaceful and voluntary ways in order to achieve what we want. But it is a skill that has, like a muscle, has to be trained, has to be used in order to be built up. And since we do not use it in our current society, it's, it's very analogous to the family structure. I think that the, the, the best analogy for what the government is, is of course the parental authority figure, both the mother figure and the father figure. There's the father uh, authority figure that tells people People how to how to live and, and punishes them if they don't. And also the maternal figure the, that provides the, the cradle to grave uh, swaddling clothes of ever loving um, the milk of government um, to, to take care of all of us and wipe our nose and, and wipe our, our bottoms when we, we have a doo doo. Um, and, <laughs> and this is uh, and, and when you've grown up and, and lived your entire life in such a system, of course, you become used to that structure to the point where you do not know how to interact with those around you without that mediating authority so we'll go and tell tell dad oh he he hit me what are you going to do about it or we'll go to mom oh i'm i'm hungry please feed me um and of course just as in the family structure we eventually as human beings have to grow into independent adults who are able to fulfill these needs for ourselves so too politically i think there is a time when we will have to grow up and become independent adults who learn how to do these things without the need for that intermediary figure but as i say we are nowhere close to that point today and that will take a, a really a revolution in consciousness i don't think there's any other way to get from here to there and so i'm not proposing that these types of ideas are anything that can or would be effectively instituted overnight but i think it is something that we have to be aware of and consciously working towards because i don't think there's any way we're going to accidentally stumble into this especially when we are in a society that's very much infested with people who do want to control others and use those uh, tools of of governmental authority and and other types of hierarchical authority to keep people in that state of dependency um, it's a very sick society that we find ourselves in, and I think everyone understands that on a certain level. The question, of course, is how we get from here to there. And I think fundamentally, it's more about consciousness. It's more about education than it is about some sort of p- particular political process or economic process. Yeah, it's it's definitely tough, too, because in today's society, we definitely have uh, – a trend towards the artificial extension of childhood. So it, it, it really does seem to me a very childish notion that people would really ask the question, well, who would build the roads and who would clean the toilets? Because I'll tell you something right now, if I looked around me in an anarchist society and I saw nobody was cleaning the toilets, I'd open up a business to clean toilets and make a killing because I would have a monopoly on cleaning toilets. Um, so this is kind of like something that people don't really take into consideration when thinking about an anarchist society because it would just run basically on free market capitalism. 
And uh, since there would be no taxes, people really wouldn't have to worry that much about things like health care because you would be able to afford it. And there wouldn't be the insurance companies getting in the way and then and then hiking the prices up because, you know, Obama wants to do Obamacare. Or I live in Massachusetts where Romney or Deval Patrick wants to do, uh, you know, the Massachusetts health care. Um, here in Massachusetts, we actually got to see Obamacare a couple of years before um, they they pushed it through in in the entire country. And um, I'll tell you something. My pocket really can't take much more of this. Uh, mm-hmm. This is tax Massachusetts all all the way. <laughs> and um, you know, I I find it increasingly more difficult just to live. And it it has it, it's kind of forced me uh, to the conclusion quicker than I may have reached it myself. Um, that this system just can't work much longer. And um, well, well, let me let me dispute what you said there because I, I of course, I do agree um, personally. I would uh, argue for those types of economic uh, uh, solutions to to the problems that that you talked about. But I realize there are going to be people in the audience who do not like the sound of those those types of solutions. Oh, so we have to pay people in order to to clean the toilets, and this is how it's all going to work. And if you if you're too poor, then you'll just have dirty toilets. That type of thing. And I want to stress once again that it's I don't think it's fundamental to anarchism itself, or even the idea of an of an anarchical society that it would. Uh, that all societies, all all communities would be organized on those capitalist principles. I think there would be groups, uh, communities that do try to organize through uh, collective ownership, uh, collective um, um, uh, distribution of, of wealth, etc. And I personally wouldn't want to live in those communities because I do think they are destined to fail. But I certainly would not dispute anyone's right to attempt to live in those communities or to form them and to prove me wrong. Because ultimately, once again, this is not about my particular idea of how people should live their lives or in fact any person, individual's idea of how they, people should live their lives. I think it's about allowing people the freedom and the liberty and the space to construct whatever type of community they are more, most comfortable living in. And why should you care what I think about whether or not it will work? The point is not to or argue with me. It, the point is to create the community that you want. And, uh, and I, again, I say I would I would obviously gravitate towards the anarcho-capitalist community, but I'm certainly not um, in any way saying that's the only type of community that could exist in an anarchical society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just uh, that's the way that I would see it working working best anyway. Um, now, have you seen any movements around the world that, that have anarchist tendencies or, or see any on the horizon? Uh, yes, uh, yes and no. I mean, there are obviously organizations and institutions out there that that self-identify as anarchist and that um, that that attempt in their own way to organize as anarchist. And in fact, I mean, one one thing that we can point to in recent years, the anti-globalization movements and uh, that, that really started to re- come to a head in the uh, the Battle of Seattle back in 2000, I believe it was, the World Trade Organization protests, etc., was heavily influenced by, by anarchists, anarchist groups. Um, I, again, keeping in mind that anarchism traditionally, um, the, the traditional roots of anarchism has been in a radical left ideology. It's only in, in more recent years that anarcho-capitalism and has been changing people's conception of what anarchism might be, but uh, but there's been a lot of uh, socialist leaning and and uh, communist leaning um, activists who call themselves anarchism. Uh, the the anti globalization movement has been one of those places where those groups have come to the fore. But of course, it's also led to the black bloc and uh, and things like this, which of course a lot of people um, who do not uh, who, who do not really study these things tend to automatically associate with anarchism and that's I think another another reason why I think anarchism is a problematic word in and of itself because it brings with it the associations not only of chaos and and violence and, and, and you know it's just total anarchy as <laughs> as people usually say um, but also because it does have uh, those specific connections in the popular cultural uh, imagination to to uh, violent, radical uh, bomb throwers, you know, Russian bearded bomb throwers um, and assassins. And uh, there there have been waves of terror caused by self-identified anarchists in the past, including a period from the early 1880s until 1914 of a wave of assassinations of political leaders that were committed by people calling themselves anarchists who – um, call, said they were uh, undergoing something called the propaganda of the deed, i.e. they were trying to 
do something in order to show what the anarchist ideology was and that something was killing um, world leaders um, as, a, as a type of statement, I guess. And uh, so we saw um, U.S. President McKinley, for example, and of course, culminating in the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which set off World War One. So, um, uh, so there, there has been these waves of terror that have been caused by anarchists in the past, and that's what a lot of people associate with them. So when we talk about, for example, the anti-globalization movement, most people will think of these, these black, dressed in black masked goons who go around throwing things through Starbucks shop windows as if that's a great uh, political statement. Of course, I think there is much more to be said about that phenomenon and what forces are really behind it, including, of course, in 2007 at the um, Montebello protests um, where there was a protest specifically against something called the SPP, the Security and Partner uh, Prosperity Partnership, that was a type of nascent North American Union that activists were very concerned about. There was uh, at those protests uh, a, a a group, or, or sorry, two specifically two masked individuals who were uh, seen to be carrying rocks and threatening the police line, um, who ended up getting taken in by the police and were identified as and eventually admitted to be actually a a policeman. They were policemen who had been dressed up as protesters who were uh, starting to try to entice the police into acting against the protesters. So I think we can see something of that phenomenon in these mysterious masked men who show up. And uh, for example, in the 2010 Toronto G20 summit, there were the the masked anarchists, uh, quote unquote, who showed up and set the uh, police car on fire. And that became the iconic image of the G20. And again, there are very, very important questions about who these people were, where they came from, and why some of them were allowed to run behind the police line um, as they were running away from some of the other protesters. So again, I think that there's a lot of manipulation that goes on to try to create that that. Uh, that link in people's minds between anarchism and violence. And unfortunately, it's been very effective. So a lot of people see that uh, the the so-called anarchists in the anti-globalization movement that are going around smashing things and, and setting things on fire and say that that must be anarchism. Whereas I think that the, the actions taken by a lot of the protesters at something like the Battle of Seattle back in 2000, linking their arms together and, and refusing to move and that type of peaceful uh, protest was probably more, I think, reflective of, of the anarchist uh, elements there. But at any rate, that's one example of a place where we see a, a flowering of this. But to be honest, I, I don't think there's a lot of very effective anarchist organization going on in the world right now because, again, um, I think that there's an awful lot of time that's spent kind of navel gazing in anarchist circles about um, and 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 also about hyphenization. It's anarcho syndicalist or anarcho communist <laughs> or anarcho capitalist or an individualist anarchist or collectivist anarchist. So that people tend to wall themselves into very very small corners and refuse to associate with other groups to the point where they are unable to accomplish anything. So you'll find online there are websites that are devo- devoted to anarchist writings and anarchist thought, and there's a lot of philosophical conversation going on, but not. Not a lot that I say uh, you can really point to as in terms of what's happening in a, in a real sense that you can actually see on the ground that's that's changing anything. And again, I don't put a lot of stock in that at this particular moment because I do uh, – again, I think this is more about a, a really a generational process of preparing society for the idea of letting go of their rulers, which is an interesting concept because usually we th- tend to think that the rulers have control of us. I think – Ultimately, it's the other way around. And once we realize that and it's that we are the ones who are gripping onto our rulers in a type of perverse Stockholm syndrome, once we realize that, then we can let go of those rulers. We can form the types of societies and communities that we want. And uh, all of this, uh, the, 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 the protest and everything that's necessary, I think will not be necessary at that point. I think it will be more a process of, of letting go of those, the old structures and creating our own. And uh, once we reach that part, part point, I think we will be on the cusp of becoming political adults. Mm. Yeah, and I've uh, I, I've been doing a lot of research lately into uh, the lead up to World War One, the aftermath, and then the lead up to World War Two. Been spending a lot of time in this in this area, and and one thing that's become clear to me is that when you allow these gigantic international banks the the amount of influence that they end up having over the political structure, um, they can exploit it to whatever ends that they want to. And uh, it's, it's, 
what I think needs to be done first is that we need to, to get rid of the political structures that allow those people to have the influence over the power. It's that centralization of, of political action that, that makes it susceptible to, to infiltration and subversion to exactly what you were just talking about with you know, those, those police infiltrating those movements. Um, and we've seen, it, we've seen it all over the place. I mean, uh, we've seen it in the Ukraine, seen it in Libya, seen it in Egypt where the uh, the opposition is infiltrated and subversion uh, and subverted and um, what what really has become clear to me is that like I was saying we need to get rid of the political structures that that give them the opportunity to manipulate us like they do I actually uh, picture it as the inverse. So I think that the the bedrock, the foundation, the cornerstone is the ethical principle. Once again, I think that is what we need to have in place. And then any economic or or social compact that arises on top of it, as long as it's in line with that ethical structure, I think would be allowable um, in my idea of an anarchical society. But um, on top of that, I would say that the economic or, or monetary uh, structure is the first order of the superstructure, and then the political organization is the one that uh, rises up on top of that. Okay. So rather than the political organization being the one that allows certain types of, of economic or monetary influence to come about, I think it's kind of the opposite. I think the, the political organization is really just an, an extension of the, the monetary organization of society. And in our modern monetary system that is based around these central banks that um, obviously have the the ability to to define money um, through the legal tender laws and these other things which obviously would not exist in a in a uh, in a society that did not have a government a, a central government authority um, they are able to create a monopoly on the most precious part of 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 society which is the ability to to interact with each other you and i and everyone else our, our interactions are to some extent limited by our um, by these types of laws and 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 the existence of these central banks and the monetary system that we interact in because again they get to define what money is and how it's created and of course in our current system it's created through private uh, banks creating uh, money as debt as loans that are then owed back at interest to the private banks Great thing if you're a private bank, pretty bad if you're everyone else on the planet. Yeah. So this is obviously, I think that's the first order um, of uh, the sort of the, the underlying superstructure and the political uh, superstructure on top of it. Uh, I see, I don't know prescriptively which one would need to be dismantled first or if we have to dismantle both together or if you dismantle one, the other one will fall apart. I, I Again, I wouldn't claim to know that because there are so many variables at play and uh, maybe that's above my pay grade. But it's... Uh, uh, it's certainly something that that needs to be done. And I think unless and until we attack that fundamental issue of the monetary organization of society, I think it's uh, it's a lost cause. Because, again, you can de really determine so much about the society we live in simply by controlling that one aspect of it. What do we use to interact with each other? Um, OK, James, we're coming up to the end of the time that we have today. Um, but is there uh, any parting words you'd like to leave us with today, James? Well, again, I really hope that people can approach the idea of anarchy and anarchism without too many preconceptions, because it's not only the, the kind of preconceptions that I think everyone identifies, which is that anarchy equals chaos or anarchy equals bomb throwers or what have you. But it's also the, the more subtle types of, of pre predetermined uh, ideas that we have about anarchism. For example, I mean, people who are approaching it or only learning about it from the voluntarist or, or anarcho-capitalist positions might not know about the, the, the really um, deep and, and rich philosophical context of it that goes back more towards the socialist traditions than towards the, the, the capitalist traditions. And, and even if you disagree with that, I think it's incumbent on all of us to know more about it, which is why I'm trying to do this uh, well-read anarchist series so that we can come to a better understanding of this uh, philosophy. So again, <laughs> maybe this entire conversation is just about really starting the conversation about what anarchism is or what it could be. But again, I, I think that perhaps that's appropriate because because ultimately, I think anarchism is not a single prescriptive solution for everything. It's more like opening the door to the possibilities that are that we can imagine when we th start to think about a society without specific authoritarian control. And uh, I don't know about you, but I want to think about that type of society. And I want to start preparing myself and my son and future generations for that society, which I think is the primary task that we should all be engaged in thinking about it in these days. So hopefully you and uh, the listeners out there can help uh, join in on that process.
Absolutely, James. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. All right. Have a good day, James. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the 2010 Video Archive DVD. Buy your copy today at CorbettReport.com.